welcome everybody to another episode of the nonprofit show day from Ireland. Welcome, Neil Driscoll. Oh, Driscoll. Thanks, Julia. Oh, Driscoll. oh, Driscoll. I'm easy. Thanks, Julia. Lovely to be here with you. It's wonderful. Okay, now listen, my friend, you got to correct me if I if I say that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to really dig down into best practices uh, of grant management, which everybody knows um, how our country uh, has been transformed by these amazing numbers of grants. Some small, some massive, some private, some federal. I mean, it, it's really um, caused a lot of heartburn for so many people. And so we're really excited to get Neil's um, approach on what's going on and what uh, your company, submit.com, <laughs> is talking about and seeing and so we'll get into that uh with neil but again we're super excited um to have neil here if we haven't met before i'm julia patrick ceo of the american Nonprofit academy jared ransom my trusty sidekick is in the south this week um on vacation so she'll join us back next week and then hint hint i'm gonna be taking off a couple days but um anyway we want to make sure that we thank and express our gratitude for all of our presenting sponsors who are with us day in and day out. We were talking to Neil in the green room chatter. We are coming upon our 600th episode, uh, which is just a mind blowing thing for me. And those, these sponsors have really helped us to achieve that because most of these sponsors have been with us since day one. They include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Nerd, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. Again, thank you so much to these folks. If you want to see this episode again, share it or go back to any of our uh, amazing episodes, you can find us on Roku, YouTube, Vimeo, Amazon Fire TV, and now on podcast, wherever you stream your uh, content, cue us up and you can we can go with you. Okay, Neil O'Driscoll coming to us from Ireland. Tell us where you are in Ireland. I'm on the, the very south coast of Ireland, on the Atlantic. Um, we're a Cork-based company, but we're spread out around the south coast since the pandemic, everybody working from home. So, um, yeah, I mean, as you probably know, Ireland is a, the Silicon Valley of Europe, effectively. There's a yeah. fierce, a really thriving tech scene here. Yeah. And that's what Submit.com was born out of about 10 years ago. And so talk to us about what Submit.com does because we have you here today on the nonprofit show for a very specific reason mm -hmm. and i'd love to to give our viewers and listeners kind of some context of how yeah you, how you came to I, us i'll try and keep it short because it's a, it's a, we do a lot um, okay. we do submission management um hence the name um we've been had a heavy focus on grant management for about 10 years but to us a grant starts with a submission you need to create a form you need to collect data from your applicants and you need to push it through a process. Um, it's it's, it's the, the, the design of the process, whether it be casting for television, whether it be hiring for a new job or whether it be grant management. From a tech challenge perspective, they're all the same problem. I mean, we have custom tools for each of those sectors, grant management being one, but that's, that's how we started. Amazing. You know, one of the things that we have noticed a lot um, in our sector is I think it's become very evident that the nonprofit sector is really way behind on technology. And one of the things that the, the pandemics have done is it's pushed us in the sector to be more um, open to mm. adopting technology. I'm wondering if you're seeing that. If you I am seeing that. I mean, in the grant management sector, we traditionally, a lot of our customers would have been government agencies. Mm -hmm. um, since the pandemic, I mean, we've nonprofits coming on board at a much greater rate. So we're in the we're in the lovely position of sitting in the middle with hundreds of grant management customers, seeing what each of them do well, what each of them do badly. And sometimes there are cross learnings to go from what governments do into the nonprofits and vice versa. I mean, broadly speaking, and obviously this is a generalization, governments, government agencies tend to be possibly over-engineered sometimes. And that's a that's a pitfall, trying to over-design a process. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
yeah. nonprofits tend to be on the other end of the scale, moving from paper sometimes. But I actually find it easier to to move a, a nonprofit into the digital world than to digitize a government process because there's there's less to think about a big, a big part of what we do is engaging with our customers so we get them to question what are you trying to achieve you know in, in grant management what are what are your desired outcomes um what steps do you need in your process to achieve that and some of our established customers namely the government ones have processes that have evolved over years and years and years they often add in steps to their process they very rarely take them out and then they end up with a a monster. So um, what a good comment. Yeah, absolutely. Just to keep adding as opposed to editing mm, and refining. Yeah. Interesting. Well, let's talk about some of these things that you've learned. And um, given this this context with which you get to see both sides of the, the table, which I always think is the best place to be. And we're going to be talking about best practices. And you started to kind of share with us this application management thing. How far back have we been or do we need to get to to understand application management? I mean, are we is this kind of a new thing or are we, you know, way under utilizing systems? I mean, no, not, nothing has changed since the days of pen and paper to a certain extent. The steps are the same. If you digitize a process, yeah, there are tools there to make things much more efficient. But on a kind of a broad level, if you're designing an application process, you want to, whether it be on paper or whether it's digital, you want to think of a few words. One is clarity and transparency, I think. You need to tell your applicants what the rules of the game are. That's something a lot of people skip. You know, if there's a scoring rubric, what is it? What are you looking for? What, what are your desired outcomes? The clearer you can be at that stage, the more applications you will get in, and ultimately, the, the better outcomes you will have as a nonprofit. Um, then there's and simplicity is another word that I would use. I, I touched on it earlier. Try not to overcomplicate the process. You, you don't want to put barriers in the way of your of your potential grantees. Yes, you need to ensure compliance. You need to ensure that they meet the eligibility criteria. You need to gather enough information to make an educated decision on whether to award them a grant or not. But a lot of the time, we, we when we engage with customers, we'll go through their paper forms and we'll say, you know, have a look at it. See, can you cross anything out? And that can be a fantastic, fantastically worthwhile exercise. Yeah, interesting. Well, you know, it seems to me too that in the at the end of the day, you want to meet the expectations of everyone. And if you can't start out declaring what it is you're trying to achieve, um, you're going to have a misalignment between the grantee and the grantor, I mean, it, it, it's just going to, it sets you up for failure almost. Uh, absolutely. I mean, it, it, there's, people can be very covetous of, of things like scoring or their in-house processes, whereas as much as is possible, you should open the doors, let people see what you're trying to achieve. I mean, not nonprofits have nothing to hide. They're generally trying to do good in the world. Yeah, yeah. Um, when you talk to clients, are you seeing this process? um how reticent are they to do that I, I think you said something very interesting people are fearful to you know open up or be be transparent about this what do you see what are you seeing i think the more organized and the more thought has been put into your own systems the more open people tend to be about them that's a generalization again and i can only talk in general terms today but <laughs> If you're confident in your own systems yeah. and you're confident that you have systems that you've thought through the process, then you should have nothing to fear by sharing that with the applicant. Mm -hmm. And that can often be a very quick exercise. You know, again, it comes back to what are my desired outcomes? How do I want to, how do I want to achieve them? Um, if you believe in your own systems, then it, it, it's a lot easier to share them. So that's- I love that. You know, that's like, that might be, we still have time with you on the nonprofit show, but that might be the wisest thing I've heard this week. <laughs> because, you know, Thank you. you know, Neil, no, I'm serious. Um, that is a message that filters down through so many aspects of our nonprofit sector. That's, that's brilliant. That's cool. I'm going to have to like write that down and put it that on a sticky note on my desk. <laughs> that's a good thing. Okay. So you've already charmed me and amazed me with, 
this first best practice, but now I really want to start talking about this consistent communication aspect because at the core of what you just said, that's a communication issue. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, communication is huge in grant management. There's first thing we touched on, tell people the rules of the game. Then there's, I suppose, communication can get complicated because these days people have so many channels, whether it be social media, whether it be your website, whether it be emailing past applicants. The danger with all these channels is that you don't have one hub where people can go to to get the rules of the game, you know. So if you're if you're directing people via Twitter, bring them back to either your web page or, or a tool like a, a grant management platform where they can have an archive or a repository of the information they need before applying, have a common destination. Um, and that's before you even get into the process of managing a grant itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, within that, I can touch on what we do at submit.com. You have things like acknowledgement emails. So you've got automation built in and any, any grant management platform will have that to improve your efficiency. So if you're doing it in pen and paper, you'll get something through the post. You'll have to say thank you received and update people by post every time or by email. Um, and there's, so, so that's, there, there's also so the landing page, there's automated emails, there's a direct communication with applicants. So do you collaborate with your applicants? Not every grant is created equal. So yeah. sometimes the team will want to help people put their best foot forward. Otherwise, other systems will say, no, you submit it, that's it, we're adjudicating it, ruling on it with an iron fist. So you get direct messaging. You'll probably have a team dealing with the grant applications. So again, a kind of a hub is nice if you can, if I can look at an application and see any messages sent by my colleagues to that applicant. Um, then you'll have group messages. Reminders are a common one. You're, you're, you're a week out from a deadline. I love that. You've got all these draft applications. Again, another advantage of having a digital platform. You want to see the drafts. You want to send a reminder to them in bulk and you want to send the same reminder to everybody so you've got no favorites. Right. Um, <laughs> right. That's that's a good comment. You know, Neil, um, one of the things that I am fascinated by with all of the guests that we've had on, you know, we've had well past 500 guests. And uh, when we have foundation folks or people that are granting money or resources, scholarships, whatever, they always say, please don't be afraid to call us or contact us that there seems to be this fear level of the relationship between the funder and the nonprofit. And what I hear you saying um, with, your, with your orientation of your product, maybe this helps eliminate some of that fear because if there's a portal or there's a place to go to get communications, that makes it easier. I mean, is that part of your process or is this just- yeah, Absolutely, and, and I mean, a lot of the time you'll have, a, you'll have questions asked by one person that somebody else will be afraid to ask. It's the same questions. Yeah. So having your FAQs on that landing page is a, is a yeah. very, very beneficial thing. And, and you touched on that communication between the grantee and the grant maker as well. When the process, as the process pre-grant pre assessment, post-grant process concludes, get feedback from your grantees. They're the people with their ear to the ground. Ultimately, they're the people that you want to help. You'll probably be running a similar grant again next year get to get get their feedback did they enjoy the process what were their issues with it is there anything you could do better all of our customers were most successful listen before during and after the process to their grantees and i agree with that but it seems to me like there would be fear to be that transparent with somebody who you want to do business with or get money from I mean, yeah. how does that work I mean, yeah, you're, you're right in saying nobody wants to insult the hand that feeds them, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, but I mean, crit constructive criticism isn't an insult. And if you build up a rapport with your grantees and they know they can trust you, they know that you're on their side, then, then I mean, it, it, they're, they're confident in giving con constructive criticism. Yeah, yeah. That would be my, my take on it. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a more emotionally mature place to be. I also think too that sometimes um, and I'd love your feedback on this. Sometimes it seems like we have funders who might not have a realistic expectation of what their money can do or their mm. investment can do. Um, do you see that? And is that part of a communication flow? Um, yeah, I mean, 
I'm slightly outside of my kind of area of expertise talking about funder feedback, where it stops with us really is being, giving the nonprofit the tools to give meaningful and robust reports to the funders. Um, where it goes beyond that, I'm kind of out of my depth, but I mean, I, we've, we get a lot of feedback from our customers asking for up-to-date reports, because I think that's the key. Information, again, is key. It's a similar problem to dealing with the grantees. Yeah. If you're giving regular reports, you, you establish the cadence of the reports between yourselves and your funders, but we'll say once a month as a process is, is underway. How many applications are coming in? What's the quality of those based on the current state of assessment? And so on and so forth, down to allocation of funds and drawdown. You may have a, a phase on a process. You might have an application phase, um, drawdown phase, post grant phase. Mm -hmm. You can report on all of those. And I mean, there's nothing like facts on the ground to, 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 to satisfy your funders right. kind of feeling that more could be done. If they, if you, the more information you give them, the less doubt they'll have. So let's drill down a little bit about that because I, I agree with you. It seems to me like um, we have more success when we can, you know, you, if you use the, the overall word communicate, but it's really about, you know, what is it you're communicating and providing the, the metrics and the data. What are you seeing? Um, obviously with a portal situation, you probably have an amazing opportunity to help everybody understand what the reporting requirements are and that they can funnel it through your system. But what are, what are some of the things you see? As regards reporting? Mm -hmm. Well, I suppose there's, it depends on which relationship you're talking about. From, from the perspective of the nonprofit, first of all, you want to, you want to see what, have we got enough suitable applications coming in? There's no worse position to be in than to have a fund and not have the quality of applications coming in to, to, to spend it effectively. Yeah. Um, so you want to have a live view again of, and that's where being able to see drafts as they come in is very valuable. Again, you don't want somebody sitting at their kitchen table or multiple applicants sitting at their kitchen table. You don't know about them. They're coming up to deadline day. You suddenly, your fingers are crossed that we'll get enough in. If you, if you go digital, you'll see what's coming down the tracks much more effectively. So that's that's one constant report that you'll be running. Mm -hmm. what's, what's coming in? Are people completing their applications? Do I need to remind them? Um, you may want to tag those even before they're completed. Say, okay, it looks suitable. It's eligible. You, you want to be tracking, are, is it junk coming down the track? Or is it quality coming down the track? So that's that's one type of tracking. The next type of tracking is, I suppose, You've got an applicant who's completed an application. They want to know what's the status of my application. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Some people, you can, you can I'm, I'm a big fan of communication, but if you send too many update emails um, with, with minimal developments, if you like, it, people tend to ignore them. And you sure. can often have sure. an, an email that follows, which requires an action. We need a, a particular document, for example. And if that's one of 20 emails that have come from, from a system yeah. saying, hey, you're, we're now considering your application. You're, it's now moved on to phase two, phase three, phase four. It can get lost in the, lost in the heap. Yeah. Um, so, so keep them up to date. Again, what we often do is, is get the nonprofit to tag applications. You can make tags visible to the candidate so they can log into the portal and see the status of their application without you filling up their inbox with, a status update yeah. that way when you require additional information they know to action it straight away right yeah so that's smart that's smart because again too you, you know you started out this conversation with a really uh good point is a lot of times it's not just one person it's a team mm. working with us um and so you really need to kind of understand um what that chain of command is going to be i guess if you will um going both directions really an interesting thing and this gets down to another question that we kind of want to talk to you about and that is managing workflow because and we already identified this this amazing amount of money that's coming through um into the nonprofit sector because of the pandemic and understanding that there are going to be people that maybe this is a new process to them so it's mm. even like more challenging 
Um, can you talk to us about workflow and, and kind of some of the things that you're seeing? Yeah, so I suppose on, on a high level, you have, you have three phases, the pre-award phase, the evaluation phase, and the post-award phase, very basic terms. A common, a common workflow that people would have would be, you'll write your grant, okay, make sure you don't overcomplicate the form, you'll release it, you'll publicize it, applications come in. You'll then want to do some triage, maybe eliminating ineligible applications, maybe ensuring compliance and so on. A very common thing after that is that you might have a panel of evaluators, might not necessarily be the same people who are doing the triage. So you want to add the, the short list of applications to a folder, share that with your evaluation committee. Ahead of time, you want to decide, do we need a scoring rubric of some sort? And that can serve a few purposes. One is um, obviously assigning rules to what you're actually looking for, making sure they fit your corporate goals. But also it gives you a, a nice um, kind of a, a track record, a record to share with unsuccessful applicants. You'll often have unsuccessful applicants saying, why? And if you have your score bars set up, you can say, well, look, you scored very high, highly in section A, B and C, but you didn't in section D. Again, don't over-engineer it, but it, 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 simplicity is key there and making sure your team all understand the workflow. Um, you, a lot of the time you'll have people giving their own free time, either pro bono or for a nominal fee for evaluation. Yeah. You wanna make, their, make it as simple as possible for them. You wanna make sure they come back to you again. Um, <laughs> you know, So, so we, 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 these evaluators, you want to mind them. You want to make sure they can log in, see all the information they need to see, assign the scores or comments that they need to assign with the minimum of fuss um, and to do it in their own time. So that's that's another another thing to think about. How, how do you want to make it as easy as possible for your evaluators? Um, and, it, and a step that an awful lot of people skip is the final step, a post-award review, particularly if your grant is running year to year. You want to learn from what you've done this year and try to make your incremental improvements for next year. But don't go down the route, don't take, make the mistake I made earlier of adding bits and not taking bits away. You know, that's a really, so I got to ask, I love that you said that, but what do you see that people are doing that? Because um, I mean, that's a that's a heavy lift for a lot of organizations. The feedback? Yeah. Not necessarily. You see, it's it's a survey. You might have, we'll save 100 applicants. Okay, you won't get a huge percentage of them completing a post-grant survey. But if you get 30% of people doing a simple survey, again, treat them like, at this stage, you have to treat them like, pro bono evaluators yeah. they're going to get nothing out of this so it's it's simple questions with with an option for comment yeah. um keep it as short and sweet as you can you you don't you don't you hope that you won't need to redesign your entire process but you might pick up one or two pointers so it's, it's a it's a link send them a bulk message thanks for participating whether you were successful or unsuccessful we'd love it if you could complete this short survey and again if you have an online platform not just submit our comment and go, go to g2.com or one of those grant management review sites if you want to compare and contrast different offerings. Um, most of them will include a facility to do that. Mm -hmm. I think that's brilliant. And I think it's even more imperative uh, for us to be doing this because this grant process is picking up speed. It's not just, and I don't know if you think that, and if submit.com, I mean, you, you have a, a global landscape to, to mm. review, but it just seems like this is a process that funders, donors, you know, organizations are really comfortable with. They like this. And yeah. it seems like it's just picking up speed. It is. I mean, particularly in the States, I think the Build Back Better program has accelerated it hugely. We've always had more of a culture of federal grants or government grants on this side of the Atlantic mm -hmm. um, than you have in the States, but it's the pandemic has changed that whether that will remain the case or not, the future will only tell. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing because I hear uh, people all the time saying, uh, you know, well, we are starting a family foundation and it might be small now, but it could be mighty later on or we're pooling our sources or corporations saying our employees want this. And so it just seems like this this uh, grant 
language um, is really, really an important thing. I've got a question that's come in, and it's a really interesting thing. I don't know uh, what part of the world it's come from, but it says, does is this product appear to serve the grantor organize, organization and or can it be worked through recipients? So meaning submit.com with all of the different um, products and platforms, are you really more geared towards those funders or is this something that a nonprofit might be able to engage with to help them steward their own grant management? Yeah, I, th I think the nonprofit rather than the funders would be would be our primary customer base because ultimately you you'll be the grant writer. You'll be mm -hmm. you get your pot of money. You 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 can you'll be designing your grant form mm -hmm. for your desired outcomes. I mean, we've had people turn it on its head. At the end of the, as I said at the top, we're a submission management platform. You could have a nonprofit with a website saying, click here if you want to be a funder. And you've, a, again, a process that you want to put those through. But realistically, you want to have a more personal touch when you're, when you're soliciting donations from your funders. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the, the person administering the grant is, is our customer. Right. And obviously, it's in their inter interest to benefit the donors and the grantee as well. Well, and this is one of those interesting things, too, is that we're seeing a lot of nonprofits that are now umbrella organizations that are then funding nonprofits. So they're, hmm. you know, a nonprofit themselves that maybe had their own mission, vision, and values for a certain area, and they've grown to such an extent that they might become an expert in their field, or they become collaborators with a lot of other small or regional or, you know, uh, nonprofits outside the area, and then they are starting to funnel down. And I think this is a new thing that we're starting to see. It's kind of like um, the United Way methodology in so many aspects that we have here in this country. But I'm starting to see it with other, you know, institutionalized size organizations, if mm. you will. You know, they're but larger. You've touched on something there. They seem to be facilitating real grassroots nonprofits. Yes. I, yes. I, yes. I think that's the change that I'm seeing. Yes. Um, yeah. Whereas in the past, it was... I'm going to mind my language here, but gray men in suits. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. But you know what I mean? Yeah, it, it, it's, totally. I'm seeing a much more diverse yeah. leadership group in the nonprofits that we deal with yeah. than we used to. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. I, I'm seeing too um, people that are saying, um, you know, we love culture. And so we're going to get, we're going to gather a group of people and we're going to support culture as opposed to just saying oh well, we only support our opera company or our ballet company or whatever but but like again um, amalgamating money and resources and then turning themselves into granting agencies it's yeah. a fascinating thing and i don't see it going away i mean i think that the pandemic has accelerated things but um yeah it, it's it's really an interesting time and the, and the key then is there's there's more money being funneled in through nonprofits for grants. How do you give that money away effectively and efficiently? Um, it can be very costly to give money away. You know, um, I, I've come across, I won't name names, obviously, but I've come across government agencies somewhere in the world that have spent more on administering grants than they have in actually getting the money to where it should be. Right. And that's brutal. Well, hey, Neil O'Driscoll, coming to us from Ireland today, we're just, I could talk to you all day long because this is fascinating and I feel like you are um, at the on the cusp of seeing this major snowball that's going to be co coming across our sector. And so it's really cool to see and hear from you about what is going on and what we can be thinking about, um, certainly best practices, but really understanding how this landscape of funding is changing. And um, so here is Neil's information, submit.com. Check them out. Their website is incredibly robust and it has all of these different um, sectors that they serve throughout the world. If you joined us in the green room chatter, submit.com is doing a lot of work in Africa. And uh, again, I'm a big believer of learning what other organizations and cultures are doing. And so, uh, it's, it's like a world tour by going to their website just to see um, what's going on. It's been an amazing conversation, Neil. 
Um, I'm so delighted that you would join us. <laughs> Thanks for having me, Julie. I really enjoyed it too. <laughs> it's been a lot of fun. Hey, I'm Julia Patrick, Jarrett Ransom, my co-host, will be back with us shortly. Again, we want to thank all of our presenting sponsors who are with us day in and day out so that we can have a conversation like we've had with Neil O'Driscoll here today from submit.com, Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, your part-time controller, Nonprofit Nerd, Fundraising Academy at National University, Staffing Boutique, and Nonprofit Thought Leader. As we like to end every episode, we want to remind ourselves and we want to remind you, stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here.